वेलकम टू टुडेज एडिशन ऑफ अमेरिकन विजन आई एम हरपीत सिंह तूर मेरे वालों आप सब में प्यार भरी सत श्रीकाल नमस्कार आदाब एंड शलोम लाइक ऑलवेज से दिस इज न्यू यॉर्क सिटी एंड क्वींस एंड यू गाट टू लव इट बिकॉज वी हैव पीपल लिविंग फ्रॉम 168 प्लस कंट्रीज स्पीकिंग क्लोज टू समथिंग लाइक 800 लैंग्वेजेस सो एंड आई लव इट कैन कंप्लेन अबाउट दैट uh but before i sh- start my show today uh, there are a few thoughts which i want to share with you and uh, those are like apne hamesha gal chaldi hagi ya pai punjab de vich ja india de vich jabbi votan pendiyan ya kadi kende ji votan hai jehdiyan ji oh sharab pa ke pala ke le liyan ja di paise de ke le liyan votan de piche motorcycle de te ja votan de piche phone de te Uh, मैं एक इस करके अच्छ गल कर रहा है वह कारण है जोड़ा वो ये आई मैंबरशिप चल रही हैगी है इतने कोइंस सिकल्चर सोसायटी की और मेरी हमेशा यह एक मेरा अपना यकीन भी आर एंड आई बिलीव इन इट कि मैंबरशिप जोड़ा भी बंदा लै सकता उन्होंने लेनी चाहिए है और मैंबरशिप आप जाके लेनी चाहिए हैगी है क्यों क्योंकि जे मैं थोड़े को आके थानु कह रहा जी तुम फार्म है जोड़े भर दौ तुम आ जाओ तो पैसे है जोड़े थोड़े दस डालर है जोड़े पर वोट दे मैं पे कर दूँगा तो यद मतलब ये आ मैं क्यों थोड़े पैसे पे कर रहा सिंपल जहाँ तो मेरा कोई परसनल इंट्रस्ट है वो जे मेरा परसनल इंट्रस्ट नहीं है तो दैन वाई वुड आई डू इट नंबर वन नंबर टू की असी इन्ने के चीप या भी दस डालर की खातर असी अपना जमीर बेच देवे क्योंकि कल जब वोट पैनी है उस वेले जे हरप्रीत सिंह तूर ने थोड़े दस डालर दते हरप्रीत सिंह तूर जिन्ना मर्जी माड़ा हो कहना यार तूर ने मेरे दस डालर दते मैं तूर में ही वोट पानी है सो अपनी जमीर न अपने आप न उस प्रैशर तो फ्री रख वास्ते और एक कम्यूनिटी के वास्ते कमिटमेंट वास्ते ये बहुत ही जरूरी आ कि ती थिंक अबाउट इट गैडअप एंड इफ यू डिसाइड टू डू इट दैन गैडअप एंड डू इट ऑन योर ओन इफ यू डिसाइड नाट टू डू इट दैन डोंट लैट एनी बॉडी टू पुश यू टू डू इट क्योंकि जे किसी के कहे उत्ते करते हैं तो आई थिंक इट इज़ नॉट फेयर टू ईदर साइड ईदर टू यू और द अदर वन गोइंग टू द रेगुलर Among us today, you know, we have a gentleman who is third time New York City councilman. He is going to, he is running basically right now for a public advocate uh, for New York City. The position actually fell vacant because Tish James or Leticia James uh, got elected as Attorney General for New York State, the first female African American to be uh, elected statewide in New York. uh so that uh, actually created the vacancy for public advocate in new york city and we have at the last count there were 20 candidates uh we have one among us today and next friday i have been promised another gentleman will be here but right now we are going to talk about the gentleman who is sitting with us who is the third time city council man and he, this after this uh, 2020 uh he at the end of 2020 he will be out uh, correct me if i'm wrong right yeah 2021 2020, 2021 yeah that's yeah. right so eric oreck thanks for thank coming you. in thank you so much for having me it's a pleasure to be here oh thanks for coming in uh let's first start with you know the, i mean there is so much to discuss uh, in current politics uh i always look for somebody who is republican come on the show yeah. thanks for coming in <laughs> Uh, because uh, i'm not a republican and even though sitting here i try to be impartial have to give my opinion but i always look for any republican to come in and thanks for coming in thank you uh let us first talk about public advocates you decided to run uh based on you must have considered few factors that why you are into this race Uh, you want to talk about that uh, why you jumped into this race well the job of the public advocate is a very important one it's the second highest ranking position in the city of new york it's actually right under the mayor of the city of new york yeah if something happens to the mayor you are the mayor it's like becoming the vice president if you will if new york city had a vice president this would be considered this is the vice president would that's <laughs> in terms of understanding yeah, understanding it, right yeah. yeah 
So uh, even though you uh, have a check and balance on the bank. Yes, exactly. So in, in this instance, though, what, what is different about it is that the job of the public advocate is supposed to be someone who is independent of the mayor, someone who holds the mayor accountable, someone who is a check on the executive branch of government. And so I think that for me, it was a very natural uh, fit or a decision for me to make uh, because I've been keeping Mayor de Blasio honest since day one. I never let him get away with anything. Uh, there are a lot of uh, issues in our city, a lot of problems, and I feel that sometimes the mayor doesn't always address those problems and those issues. And if I were to get elected on February 26th, which is the date of the special election, I think I'd be in a very unique position to really hold the mayor's feet to the fire, make sure that he's accountable to the people of the city of New York, and in doing my job, I'm able to make sure that he's doing his job, what he was elected to do. The other part of the job is to be an ombudsman, an advocate for all New Yorkers, you know, not just uh, the people who vote for you and the people who like you, but for all five boroughs and for every community. And what we'd like to do is empower uh, different communities throughout the city, the new American communities, the immigrant communities in Queens that I'm so proud to represent, but in all the communities throughout the city, to make sure that they have a voice in city government because sometimes they feel like they are forgotten about or that their issues go ignored by the administration or by other elected officials. I would love to see the public advocate's office really take that to the next level and empower those communities to give them a voice in city government. Well, um, that is one thing you know, which I want to make sure let the people understand that this is a citywide election. This is not just a Queens election. This is for New York City, which means right. all five boroughs. Number one. Number two, public advocate is for New York City, not just Queens or any particular borough. Right. Uh, number three, there are always tensions between the public advocate and the mayor because of the nature of the job. But also, at the same time, there is, a, there is always, there are some common grounds also where they can work together. Uh, the, the issue for me is because if you are running for public advocate, which is a citywide office, okay, we have a couple of um, issues within New York City, starting with the MTA, okay. Uh, some, there is, there is, we have the governor who is talking about uh, congestion surcharge yeah. or uh, congestion pricing, and then we have the mayor who is talking about uh, taxing the multi-millionaire or the billionaires or the billionaires who claim to be billionaires. What do you think about it? Well, I think that, um, you know, just to take a step back, in this election on February 26th, it is nonpartisan. So I think it's important for your viewers to know that when they walk into the booth and they go to vote on election day, they're not going to see party labels on a ballot. They're not going to see uh, a Democrat or Republican or conservative. It's just going to be names on a ballot and they have to pick the person who they think is going to do the best job. It's a strictly a nonpartisan special election because of the fact that Tish James became the Attorney General. So this has never happened in the city's history. We've never had a citywide nonpartisan special election. This is the first, oh, this time, is the first time. First time we've ever do had it. So it might to, be confusing for do people. You, do you have to pick up any party name or Yes, just we pick name? the party name, and the name of my party is Common Sense. Okay. And uh, you know, other candidates have picked other names, but we thought that Common Sense would appeal to uh, a large segment of the electorate, to many New Yorkers, uh, in a bipartisan way, who feel that maybe the city is not headed in the right direction or they're not satisfied with the, the de Blasio administration, that if we can appeal to the common sense values and the beliefs that they have, that maybe that would help us carry the election. Now, you mentioned, for instance, congestion pricing. This is something that has gone back and forth between the mayor and the governor. I don't support congestion pricing. I think I'm the only candidate in the race right now that does not support congestion pricing. I want to fix the subways and buses just as much as anybody else. But I believe that congestion pricing is nothing more than um, a commuter tax on the outer boroughs. It is a Definitely it is. It is a, it is honestly, a, I'm also right. against that. Because yeah. anybody who is not living in Manhattan, right. it's not only that outer boroughs, but it is everybody, especially right. the people who live in Queens and beyond Nassau and Suffolk County people also, you're cut off. You have right. to go through the city. Yeah, no, this, but the, anyway, this is a yeah. regressive tax that's going to hurt the people in the outer boroughs in particular that have to make deliveries or have to go into Manhattan every day if they're driving a taxi or they're driving a truck, a delivery truck, or they're transporting goods back and forth. 
we're going to make Manhattan the city of the wealthy because the only people that are going to be able to afford to go there are the people who are very rich. I don't think that that is the best solution for fixing decades of mismanagement and underinvestment at the MTA. The MTA, the subways and the buses did not get here overnight. We know that the, uh, the bad state of repair that the system as a whole is in, and we have many people to blame for that. There isn't a one-shot deal or, or a silver bullet fix, such as congestion pricing, that is going to be able to undo all of that overnight. It's just not going to happen. Uh, also, taxing all of the bridges and tunnels on the East River, I think, uh, I think would really be uh, regressive and would hurt middle class and working class families in Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, the Bronx, and in other places. And I think it's going to hurt the city's economy. So I don't support it because I don't think it's good for the city as a whole. There is, there is another factor, you know, which you really look at it because uh, this is tri-state area and Manhattan happens to be the linchpin of that tri-state. Right. Okay, there are families, and I'm pretty sure you probably will also have the families who live either in New Jersey or Connecticut or in Long Island, okay? Anybody who wants to go and meet their family, right now they already pay enough through the tolls to the bridges. That's correct. So now it will be more like, okay, you know what, it's okay, we'll do the FaceTime chat and stuff like that. Because already look at the tolls going up so much. Have uh, MTA really, you know, given the details about their expenses, what they are doing? Look at the Altrin Tunnel, another example. Three years they spent time in planning to shut it and then repair. Now all of a sudden the governor says that, ah, yeah, who is to be blamed? It's, re it, it's really disappointing that no one has accepted responsibility for the MTA, the mayor or the governor. It's like a ping pong that goes back and forth. They, they fight back and forth about who is responsible for when things go wrong. But when things go right, they all want to take credit. Take right? That's politics. <laughs> I think it's time that we had a citywide elected official, a public advocate, who really cared about the issues and the problems facing the city and didn't spend so much time worrying about things going on in Iowa or Wisconsin or Washington, D.C., because we have no control over that. that. That falls under the jurisdiction of our federal elected officials and our members of Congress who represent our communities. The or public the senators. Or the, uh, or the United States uh, senators. US senators. Yep. So what we need, I think, is someone who wants to address city problems and city issues and focus like a laser beam on trying to fix and address those issues. Uh, we are going to take a uh, break here. After the break, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Thank you. Welcome back to American Vision. We are going to pick up right where we left. Okay, we're talking about congestion pricing, and of course, we got Amazon here now in Long Island City, which will be right off 59th Street Bridge. So, first and foremost, far or against? I support jobs and I support Amazon. I think it's going to provide uh, a tremendous economic boom for the borough. I think that uh, 25,000 jobs with an average salary of $150,000, that people will be lined up around the corner and down the block to work for Amazon. It is the largest internet retail uh, you know, store in, in the country, company in the country. And uh, there's a lot the of world, I, I think I, there's I, a lot of IT jobs, a lot of computer jobs, mm -hmm. a lot of jobs for Queens residents and good paying jobs. These are not minimum wage jobs. These are good paying jobs. And I support them. And, and I, also, I think it's going to be good for the borough. And also then you will have ancillary industries, if I may say, you know, right. the restaurants, the, the spin off, exactly. The spin offs, uh, which are a going multiplier to be effect. It, oh, yeah. You know, 25,000 employees are going to be having lunch at the local restaurants, are mm -hmm. going to be buying goods in the local stores, are yeah. going to need uh, taxi drivers and, and, uh, and, and, and transportation yeah. and yeah. services. I, I think that overall it is going to be something that has a positive effect on the borough. But also, I want, I want government to start encouraging more private investment in our communities and in our cities. And Amazon is full of innovation, full of really smart people. We want that investment coming to Queens. We want it coming to all across New York City. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's, uh, you know, there is some time I definitely give a credit to the Mayor Bloomberg about establishing that Cornell University. Uh, yeah, the, tech hub, the, uh, the tech hub, absolutely. Uh, the university. That's uh, that's. Uh, 
That's, that's called strategic long-term planning. Absolutely. You know? That's what is needed. Uh, you just mentioned about the taxis, and uh, within the city council, I know the yellow cab industry really got decimated once Uber came in. And there was not a level playing field. I know there are still uh, back and forth going on. There is a latest fight between yellow cab industry and uh, Albany, if I may say, about that extra congestion pricing only on the yellow cab. Right, that's right. I think that's very unfair. It's you punitive. Know? It's and uh, even though Uber said that we will be willing to pay, but still yellow cab already has like extra $2.50 or $2.75. Per ride. Per ride, per ride right. extra than the Uber. Is there anything in city council right now about that to make it level playing field? The city council passed a package of bills uh, with the intention of leveling the playing field. I think there were five or six bills in particular. Uh, I supported all of them with the exception of the cap on Uber. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that it's right to, uh, to cap uh, people's ability to earn, uh, earn a living. But let me just say this first. I genuinely and sincerely sympathize and feel for those medallion owners who the city turned the blind eye and allowed Uber to saturate the market, take up all of the ride through the, the e-hailing and ride-sharing apps, and didn't allow the yellow taxi cab industry to compete with Uber on a, level, on a level playing field. And that's why we have these very tragic and unfortunate suicide rates, because we see the medallion that was once worth upwards of a million dollars is now worth pennies on a dollar. It's worth 200,000, sometimes yeah, less. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, about 172. It's a little bit to, less than... 172,000, that's uh, if the, the range. If the city yeah. genuinely cared about the medallion owners and the taxi cab drivers in the five boroughs, then we should have bought out those medallions over five or six years. We should have phased them out and go to the medallion owners and say, listen, you know, it was worth a million dollars. We can't give you a million dollars, but over five years, we can give you a $100,000 subsidy for each one. And then after that, you have to surrender it. We'll take it off the street because it's not going to be worth much by them. We want to give you a graceful and dignified exit from an industry that's been gobbled up by, uh, by technology and by Uber and Lyft and some of these other uh, industries. If we really cared about those yellow taxi cab drivers and the medallion owners in particular, then we really should have bought them out, and we didn't. What we did do was put a Band-Aid approach and say, oh, we're going to cap Uber. Well, that's like closing the barn door after the, the animals have run out of the barn. Uber's already here. They have tens of thousands of cars on the streets, and that is helpful to some communities that are not served by yellow taxi cabs, to be quite honest. And, oh, that and, is and, true. Right? That is true. But at the same time, what we've done is we have turned a blind eye, I believe, to the yellow taxi cab drivers and the medallion owners who have seen the value of those medallions completely decimated and, and now all we're trying to do is, is pay lip service to that. I think that's wrong. And do you really think or have thought of that if you get elected public advocate that you probably will have some kind of leverage where you can use your office either by uh, suing the city or the TLC to make the field level playing Absolutely. Field? I, I will use every single tool at my disposal to hold the administration accountable, to level the playing field, to make sure that New Yorkers, especially immigrant New Yorkers, are not put at an unfair disadvantage because right now they're getting the short end of the stick and a lot of the politicians, they talk a lot of talk, but they don't walk the walk. And meanwhile, families are suffering people are suffering, people are, are feeling uh, depressed and, 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 and taking their own lives. They, one driver took his own life right outside the gates of City Hall. And, and in the suicide note, he, he actually mentioned that the reason was because the city just sat idly by and allowed this to happen. We can't allow this to happen anymore. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it really hurts because if you, we look at statistically, the yellow cab industry or any cab industry basically is dominated by new immigrants. Right and it hurts them uh, disproportionately because to begin with, they are new. They come here with the whatever they have, like $20, $100, maybe nothing in their pocket, and then they start making their life here, and then their family comes in. They already have to stand up before they start moving. That's right. And this whole crash of the prices and everything, that really killed them. Yeah, I mean, so many of the small businesses in our community are owned by immigrant New Yorkers. The the local uh, uh, bodegas or mom-and-pop shops or dress 
uh, stores or, or you know, little jewelry stores, whatever those <coughs> independently owned businesses are. And now Mayor de Blasio said he wants to provide two weeks of, of uh, you know, a government mandated uh, paid leave. It sounds like a great idea for the employees, but for the business owners, you know, you're shelling out, if you have five or more employees, you're shelling out thousands and thousands of dollars on top of all the other regulations that you're facing. If you own a laundromat or you own a bakery or you own a little restaurant or a cafe or a clothing store, the city is going to be mandating that you pay thousands and thousands Excuse of dollars me. now in paid leave and in health care costs. And the city's not subsidizing it. The city is not going to help those immigrant New Yorkers stay in business. They are already paying high rents, uh, high property taxes, and the high cost of doing business in New York getting banged over the head by every city agency, the Department of Buildings, the Department of Consumer Affairs, the, Depart the Fire Department, the Health Department, you name it, every other agency going in there giving fines, fees, regulations, violations. At what point do people say, I've had enough? We, ha we should be making it easier for people to own their own medallion or to own their own business and to support their families. The, the issue basically, you know, sometimes it comes in uh, when, when we, yeah, we do have these agencies uh, sometime you look at because I'm lo talking from um, a actual personal experience for example let us say fire department they come in to inspect your right. building right you know I know we have housing problem and we have the people living in the basements which is not legal no doubt about it but if the fire department comes in or the building department comes and they want to shut that house or they want to kick the people out of the basement Okay, so how do you think that it, the city and those owners of the building, they can have a, some common ground where those basements, they can be made in a way more accessible and safe, but at the same time, city controls but does not find the people. That's right, I think uh, as long as there are non-life-threatening conditions there, we should find a pathway for people to legalize some of those illegal units because we do have, as you mentioned, an affordable housing crisis in the city. The reason why the rents are so high is because the demand is so high. There's not enough supply, there's not enough apartments and units to rent to all of the, the people that come to New York and they want to live here. They, they love the city, they, they love the action, they love the fact that they can support their families like you mentioned and, and get a job and get on their own two feet and then become a part of the American way of life. But if we don't have places for them to live that are safe and affordable, affordable is the key thing, um, it's going to make it all but impossible for the next wave of immigrants and new New Yorkers, people who come from other states, to come here and make it in New York. It's so expensive. We have an affordability crisis. We need more affordable housing. But we also need a pathway to help homeowners and people who own those businesses to legalize the units that they have to make them safe. Uh, and give them uh, proper uh, but, regulation. But that, that also brings me to another question here about the census. In 2010 census, uh, overall at the conclusion of the census, the U.S. government uh, Department of Commerce, which actually conducts the census, they said that the population Queens increased by only 1,000. Yeah. So that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Is there anything right now being done within the city council while you're still there to talk about that? How we are going to not let the federal government kick the can in a way that we end up I, losing? I agree. This is an area that affects our communities because it determines how many representatives we have in Congress, for instance. And and also the area median income your, is based your, on that. Your so. transportation, your hospitals, your schools. Uh, schools, I mean, you name it, it's all based on the census. Every aspect of urban planning or city planning is based on those numbers that we get. It is so important that every person is counted, whether you're documented or undocumented, so that we can get those resources and we can see those federal dollars flow into our communities in the form of you know, supporting the NYPD or supporting the, the Department of Transportation or supporting our education department. Again, in every aspect, we absolutely need to be counted. The fact that 10 years ago they said that there are only 1,000 more people than there were 10 years prior to that is ridiculous. We all know that Queens is exploding. 
with population. 15, 15 seconds. We're running out of time. I'm running for public advocate. I'd be honored to have your support. There's a nonpartisan special election on Tuesday, February 26th. I'm Eric Ulrich. I'm running on the common sense line, and I want to hold our mayor accountable and deliver our services for you. Thank you. And with that note, uh, today's program comes to an end. Till next time, good night and good luck.